Welcome to Sanford on Security, where each episode, American Security Council Foundation Senior Analyst Lawrence Sanford brings you the latest in national security news and events. Mr. Sanford served as a communications officer aboard a destroyer in the U.S. Pacific Fleet, followed by four years as an officer in the clandestine services of the CIA. If you would like to support the American Security Council Foundation, please visit www.ascf.us. Thanks so much, and have a great day. Good day. I'm Lawrence Sanford. I'm Senior Analyst with the American Security Council Foundation in Florida. Our mission is to educate Americans on issues of national security, economic security, and moral leadership. Our motto is peace through strength. I have with me today George Raisley, who is the editor of Conservative HQ, and he will discuss in more detail a little bit about that wonderful organization. But the subject we're going to talk about is freedom of speech, uh, which is certainly one of the foundations of American civilization. So welcome, George. Glad you, you are here. So before we begin on the freedom of speech, could you just give us a quick rundown on Conservative HQ and its founding father? Yeah, uh, Conservative HQ was founded by Richard Vigory, who is uh, in many ways uh, the funding father, if you will, of the modern conservative movement. Uh, Richard uh, founded uh, his company in 1965 uh, in the aftermath of what everybody thought was Goldwater's defeat, but it was actually the start of the winning conservative movement. Uh, and uh, Richard has been uh, active at the national level since the, really since the 50s. And so Conservative HQ is his uh, newsletter and his uh, vehicle for spreading the good news about uh, conservatism. And George has been kind enough to publish a couple of my articles on uh, nuclear energy and green, uh, green energy not so clean. So I appreciate his input and uh, his guidance on how we can further the objectives of the uh, American Security Council, which is what I would consider to be an alliance type of organization. We have similar goals to represent America, freedom of speech, the foundation of it. So why don't we start off with the freedom of speech? You're, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many aspects to it. It's yeah, thank you. Uh, in in many respects, uh, freedom of speech has not been under so much threat uh, since the foundation of the republic. Um, today, we have not only the overweening federal government threatening freedom of speech through this uh, new uh, Biden-sponsored speech police or whatever you want to call the uh, directorate of truth <laughs> at the at the uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security but we also have speech being restricted by uh, tech oligarchs and the whole what you might call stack of uh, liberal media uh, which uh, goes out of its way to suppress uh, conservative uh, views and uh, even what I would call non-conservative facts. <laughs> and yeah. so this is a threat that we really haven't seen since uh, uh, the foundation of the Republic. The, it, it's almost like 1984 is now in 2022 with the department of, what is it, the disinformation department they want to <laughs> yeah. set up? And you get into uh, situations where what is hate speech? And uh, hate speech is something that you disagree with me on. Yeah. So you call it hate speech. I, you know, the whole concept of so calling something hate speech is not friendly as far as I'm concerned with the American principles. Just like no. a hate crime. Is it worse to kill a man who's a homophobe or a homophobic? I mean, it's the whole situation yeah. of making a crime worse because you're of a certain sexual orientation or a, sec or a certain color is ridiculous. We're all individuals created in the image of God. And every individual is worthy of being treated as an individual. Yeah, well, uh, there's, a, there's a 
popular TV show and uh, the motto of uh, the protagonist is everyone matters or no one matters. And uh, so I, that's how I approach these issues of hate speech and uh, hate crimes, which is um, that there should be no distinction on on the basis of color or um, sexual orientation or any other special category that the government decides to create. Because if, Larry, if you're in one special category and I'm not, then that makes me a second class citizen, doesn't it? Yes. Not the way it's supposed to be. Nope. Not in America. Yeah. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, <laughs> and we're all treated equal. Yeah. And not equity either. It's equal. <laughs> That's equality. That's exactly right. That's another subject altogether, this whole equity thing. Yeah. Getting back to the high-tech censorship mm -hmm. and uh, Elon Musk. Would you share your thoughts on Elon uh, Musk? You know, uh, a <clears throat> few years ago, uh, I would have... Uh, I wasn't that big of an Elon fan. Uh, he was getting a lot of grants from the federal government for various of his projects and stuff like that. But I've come to really admire the guy uh, for being a, a truth teller, if not a genius and an amazing businessman. And that is that uh, as he's been taking over Twitter, one of the things he said was free speech is essential uh, to a functioning democracy. And while we aren't really a democracy, we're a constitutional republic, the point is that uh, without the free exchange of ideas, uh, free people cannot remain free. And uh, I applaud him for that. I also applaud uh, Elon for um, ferreting out the truth of some of these uh, high-tech social media platforms in which a lot of uh, their readership, viewership, uh, membership, whatever you want to call it, is phony. And uh, his latest um, gambit about determining how many fraudulent or bot um, users are on Twitter was very, very telling because it seems to me that what he's really, without saying it, uh, uh, revealed that a uh, great amount of the value of uh, the company is based on fraud. Um, you know, these bot accounts or inactive accounts aren't um, revenue generators for the company. Uh, they inflate the value of the company, and they certainly aren't contributing to free speech. No. That, that came out with James O'Keefe and Project Veritas when uh, Absolutely. they uh, spoke to one of the senior engineers at Twitter who admitted he was a communist and didn't believe in free speech. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The whole system is corrupt. And one of the questions that I don't think you have an answer, I know I don't have an answer. How did people like that get to be in those positions of power? So it's got to be the culture within the company. Well, it, well, it is. And, and actually, again, this is something that Elon Musk has sort of revealed to all of us, perhaps inadvertently. But these guys aren't technical geniuses or um, computer wizards. They're political operatives. And they're hired on that basis. And uh, one could make the argument that Twitter and Facebook are not social media platforms where, uh, you know, you can exchange pictures of your grandchildren or funny cat videos or whatever. They're actually for-profit political operations uh, with a strong leftist bent. And... Um, particularly with Twitter and its, uh, you know, since 2016 campaign to uh, eliminate uh, conservative viewpoints from the platform, uh, you know, they haven't made any money. They've lost billions. The only two profit, profitable years they have or years that they made a profit on operations were uh, 2016 and 2017, I believe. Uh, which, oddly enough, were the two years that Trump was most active on the site. <laughs> you know, so they boot Trump and promptly lose a billion dollars, uh, 
But, uh, you know, again, it's not about free speech for them. It's about pushing a political agenda. Yeah, Dorsey seems to be, Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, seems to be coming around to support Elon Musk, but he was there during all the censorship. So can you explain how Dorsey has come around or is it he was misrepresented? Or? Well, I, I can't really explain it, Larry, uh, other than uh, I suspect that, uh, like a lot of people in uh, California and the tech world, they're subject to peer pressure. Um, you know, if, if you're in that world, uh, in Hollywood or uh, Silicon Valley, uh, and you inadvertently let it be known that you're a conservative, uh, you're not gonna get invited to the parties. Uh, it's gonna be hard on your kids. Uh, your wife uh, isn't going to get invited to lunch at the, you know, Hollywood Hotel or whatever. And uh, suddenly, it's a lot better to just be quiet or to amen uh, the left. And I, I believe that's how it works. It's human nature. Yeah. One of the things that concerns me about Elon Musk, and I agree with everything you said about him, is the fact that he has a huge te Tesla factory in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. And for, in order to do business in China, and they gave him all sorts of hundreds of millions of dollars worth of property and factory mm -hmm. and loans and so forth, is you've got to basically <clears throat> sell your technology to the Chinese. So give it to them. Give it to them. And so uh, the technology of Tesla is now in Chinese hands in the overlap of Tesla into his SpaceX programs and some of the other stuff is a concern to me. I just don't know how much of a hold the Chinese have on him. Yeah, I, I don't know either, Larry. I, that's a very legitimate concern, uh, something that I think a lot of people in, in uh, our shared background of uh, national security uh, would do find concerning. And uh, it also, speaking of free speech, uh, you'll notice that Elon is not one to criticize the red Chinese. Uh, he would never say about Xi Jinping what he said about Biden, for example. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that, uh, you know, any American business, be it Apple or Tesla or uh, any of our computer uh, companies who have major manufacturing facilities in China, they're not going to criticize uh, the red Chinese government uh, or any of its uh, senior leadership. Which, which gets us into uh, the permutation of free speech in China affecting mm -hmm. America. Namely, they, they have such a lock on Congress, for example, major leaders in Congress never speak up about China because there's mm -hmm. such an overlap of financial interests and so forth. I mean, the, the majority leader of the House, uh, the Senate Republican is Mitch McConnell. He's tied in with his wife big time with yeah. the Chinese shipping industry and uh, yeah well look at all the money that uh, the Pelosi's have made uh, off of their relationship with China and uh, again th this was a uh, one of the greatest follies of our leaders of the 70s and 80s was to assume that if we engaged with the red Chinese that we could make them more like us and what's happened is that the balance of the economics have t tilted so far in their favor that they are making us more like them. Yes. And uh, that was a, a, a great um, uh, misconception on the part of our leaders, including, you know, some, some good ones who were patriots. Uh, um, but that was a major error in understanding how the Chinese operate. So what is the solution then? <laughs> Reinstitute well, American values and take... The, you know, the solution is uh, for us to uh, reestablish our manufacturing base, to stop exporting jobs, uh, to stop exporting technology, and... Uh, much as I am a free market, free enterprise, keep the government out of business guy, uh, you know, we have to look at ways of leveling the playing field. Uh, and again, when I was at the, at the White House uh, uh, back in the uh, early 90s, uh, we had tech 
people come in and tell us, you know, our, we're getting our lunch eaten by the Japanese and the Chinese because they get all of these advantages. And of course, the common Republican conservative answer to them was, well, you know, government, we can't do subsidies and things like that. Well, um, if we have to do some of those things to bring uh, businesses back, manufacturing in particular of critical infrastructure like computer chips and things, maybe we ought to take a look at that. And uh, I hope that Ronald Reagan does not reach down from heaven and hit me with a lightning bolt for saying that, but... Uh, well, one of the fastest growing periods in American history was after the Civil War when we had the highest tariffs in the world mm -hmm. to protect American manufacturing. So. Mm -hmm. And the government uh, subsidized railroads to cross yeah. the continent. So, sounds they, suspiciously like "Make America Great Again." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Getting back to freedom of speech. Yeah. So we touched briefly on the uh, Silicon Valley with Twitter, but we have the issues of Google. We have the issues of Facebook, where they basically censor conservative thought and expression. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I don't see how you can control that other than making them, what is it, 230, section 230, make it so that they can be sued by lawyers. And I must say, I'm not a big fan of the yeah. legal profession, but maybe that's the answer. Well, you know, that's interesting that you should bring that up, Larry, because uh, I have advocated for a good long while that uh, that section of the U.S. Code uh, requires them to con conduct themselves in a certain way. And if they take themselves out of the strictures of Section 230, then they lose the benefits. And so it would be my uh, position, if I were uh, an attorney uh, pursuing a case in that regard, that, look, you guys aren't following the rules that 230 sets down, therefore, uh, you can be sued. Um, so far, uh, no one has had the deep pockets to pursue that theory of the law, <laughs> and it is only a theory. Uh, but there is some support for that position out there, uh, and so it'd be interesting to see. Uh, you know, if I if I won the lottery tomorrow, I'd put a couple million dollars into. Wouldn't should not be the this. responsibility of the attorney general, or is that to politicize so much that they're not going to touch that one? Um, one would think that it would be. There are certainly all kinds of antitrust, for example, other ways that the tech uh, should be looked at. But so far, no attorney general has really pursued it. Um, you know, during the Trump years, they started to look at it. They got some bad rulings, uh, and it just kind of fell apart. Well, actually, I see where they're starting to lay off people, so maybe they're starting to... Uh have to readjust their goals too. So people are sort of deserting Facebook and Google, maybe. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to measure. Well, it is hard to measure. And part of it is because they assess themselves. And so you really only have um, their word for it, so to speak, that they're doing or not doing certain things. And that's one of the interesting things that Elon Musk, again, was saying, well, you know, I'd like a third party to take a look at see how many of these uh, Twitter accounts are fake or inactive or they're bot accounts. And uh, Twitter's existing management was like, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. Yeah. Well, oh, I wonder why. Yeah, and uh, I see their stock is tanking too, like along with everyone else's for that matter. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, let's not wish for the stock market to go down too far. <laughs> yeah, you're right on that one, <laughs> especially at our age. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Freedom of speech in the media, print media, New York Times, Washington Post, you'd almost have to say they're Marxist organizations. Well, they, they absolutely are. And uh, their newsrooms uh, are reflective of the college culture of the last 20 years. Uh, and so- I'd say more than 20 years. Well, fair enough. But coming from a newspaper family, and uh, my family began in the newspaper business in 1835, and they we- just got out of it when my mom retired uh, a while back oh. as uh, the editor of a small town newspaper. And uh, so, you know, I would like to think that there were actually some conservatives or at least some 
uh, open-minded, uh, solidly uh, grounded in Americanism people in newsrooms around the country at, until recently anyway. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not going to fight you in your history. That's Well, no, no. But I mean, but the big city newspapers, you know, forget about it. I mean, uh, they reflect, uh, you know, the undergraduate attitudes of uh, Harvard, Yale, Georgetown, Columbia, Journal. Columbia School of Journalism, Northwestern, uh, same way, you know, they're all very far left. Uh, they're all um, Marxist, as you said, and uh, they're all of the opinion that America is a detestable place uh, that was founded on slavery and um, the abuse of the working man and uh, colonization and all these other bad things instead of the greatest achievement of Western civilization, which is the United States of America and our culture. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that had contaminated the schools is the number one history book of America was written by a communist, yeah. How, <laughs> Howard Zinn. I mean, how could any school department okay or authorize the purchase of a history book written by a communist? Do you think that might be pro-American? No. no. Absolutely not. And one of the great things about uh, our governor here in Florida uh, is that he pressed the legislature and the legislature passed a bill to eliminate uh, all of this kind of wokeism or anti-Americanism from textbooks. And they're even, they've even, you know, look at math books and found it there. Yeah. And they're not making it up. Yeah. Um, it's real. I actually read their report, uh, which was uh, tedious in some respects, but uh, astonishing in others because of this, the way that this leftist stuff is, has crept into textbooks. Yeah. A plug for American Security Council. Yes. We, we were involved also, in, in addition to this particular podcast series on security, we're also involved in history teaching in American schools. We have uh, an assignment blue, which works with the, the police going into classrooms. And we have the American History Live project where we have avatars working in the classroom with children teaching American history in particular around the revolutionary period of time on our Declaration of Independence and uh, uh, Constitution. So we're trying to change the flow of education and we're re having a wonderful reception within the school system and we hope the government to, uh, to proceed on homeschooling the charter schools, we're, we're making progress, and we hope to take it national in the not-too-distant future. Well, that's great because, of course, the, the founding of this country is one of the most exciting periods and the most consequential uh, period, in, certainly in Western culture. And um, the ideas that were propounded by our founders, uh, the notions of freedom of speech, uh, the right to self-defense, uh, the protection of property, the sanctity of uh, the vote, uh, all of these things are aspirations of people around the world today. And uh, they, were, they were unique uh, in world history at that point by, you know, a, a bunch of farmers and planters and country lawyers and small businessmen and ship captains and... But they were all highly educated. The leaders were highly educated. That's, that's right. Yeah, so. In the classics. Yes. <laughs> Which is not... Now you can take a... You can major in English in the American universities. You don't have to take Shakespeare. Yeah. Well, and you can... Yeah. You have the, the, the classics of... Uh, of... Uh, wokeism, you know, do not include... Uh, any of uh, the Greek or Latin uh, yeah. thinkers on democracy and uh, citizenship or anything like yeah. that. So. Well, do you have any final thoughts on uh, I'll, I'll, uh, freedom of speech? Yeah, I'll, I'll share my, my little three by five note card here with a quote from James Madison. Free speech rights must be absolute. 
For the people to rule wisely, they must be free to think and speak without fear of reprisal. I think that's a good way to close our session. And I want to thank you, George, for joining with me. Well, thanks for I having me. I appreciate your thoughts. Thank you.